Uh, the microphones are right here, so we... we Come on, dude. That was pretty good, but anybody that wants to be heard, stand over stand over here, Let me stand over there and They're Don't stand over here by me, Brother Lee. I don't want you to mess me up. I'm okay with you. Brother Ronnie, I haven't called on anybody to pray or anything, so if you don't mind doing that. Okay. We're just about our same routine. We're not taking an offering, so we just... So, not going to go around fellowship either. No. Four <laughs> songs, go way, bump elbow, straight in a row. <laughs> you have something to say, that's fine. Six, okay. Okay. Six, 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 six. All right, let's stand for our first. Wow, that is hot. It is. Let me step back a little bit. It sounds loud to you. Yeah. No, right, let's stand for, uh, have prayer, and then we'll start with our first hymn, uh, page 607. But let's, let's go to prayer first. Uh, Ask God's blessing on the service we have here. So, uh, Blake, would you lead us in prayer, please? All right, let's turn to page 607. Do the first, second, and last verses. Footsteps of Jesus. 607 verses 1, 2, and 4. Page 440, a shelter in the time of storm. 440, uh, let's do all four verses on this. 440, all four verses. Shelter. 
398. My Jesus, I love thee. Let's, let's do all four of these too, please. 398. 398. And uh, I guess we need to be reminded that they made a misprint on this. For the last refrain, we go back. We don't do from shore to shore the second time. We do forevermore. Let it shine forevermore. I don't know why they printed it in the book this way. But anyway, first, second, and last verses. 371, verses 1, 2, and 4.
Bible. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I have to do a little housework here. I don't want this uh, instrument to get too hot in the sun. Okay, it's certainly, let's see, I won't need this, Jonathan Wright. It is certainly good to be here. Uh, Rocky, I, I don't know if his parents have told him to say this or not, but he has said it a lot lately. Uh, he says, have you been missing me? <laughs> and I said, I sure have. I believe uh, that young and realizes that his parents have taken him to Alabama, and so he don't know where he's at, just like anybody else that goes over there. <laughs> so he says, have you been missing me, or is it the opposite? Does he say, have I been missing him? I'm not sure, but he says something like that. And uh, so... I'm telling you this morning that I really miss you. I'm, I am so sorry that uh, we are socially distanced from each other. I had rather it not be that way, uh, but I am willing for a time if, it, uh, if it's necessary for us to do that. And I hope that you are. I'm sorry for any inconveniences. We're doing the best we can. And look on the bright side. The chairs you are sitting in are very nice and comfortable. I hope. <laughs> I had to sit there last week, and I did okay. Uh, one of my favorite verses of Scripture, it may seem a little strange to you, but in Isaiah, the 50th chapter, and verse 10, uh, this is a verse that, if you were to read it, you probably would just read the next verse and say, well, I'm ready to get into the next chapter and see what it has to say. There are probably a lot of places in the Bible where uh, people are prone, you know, prone to read something and they don't see anything there. They just see maybe some ancient record of something that occurred. And so this may be one of those verses. It may be something that... Uh, is not easy to understand, but it has uh, become a favorite of mine. And uh, I, since I'm not here to give a testimony this morning as such, I won't get into all of that. Uh, but I just want to read one verse in Isaiah, the 50th chapter. And the, that verse is verse 10. And if you would like, you can read some before and some after. But uh, this is what I would like to share with you. So, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will read that one verse of Scripture. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. I thank you so much for your people who have not forgotten you. They were willing to get up this morning and to come here and to congregate together to worship you and to listen to your word and to receive instruction and to be an encouragement to each other to honor the Lord Jesus Christ um, in celebration of what he has done. He's given his life. He was buried. He rose from the dead. He ascended back into heaven, and we have the promise of his 
return, and I believe that will be soon, and thank you for that. We pray that you'll bless us now as we look at your word. There may be something in this, these verses here that could be meaningful to somebody. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, and I may have to stop and get a little water. I'm taking some medicine, and uh, it's, uh, I'm not drunk or anything, but I am dry-mouthed. <laughs> Blood pressure medicine, of all things. I didn't know that that would do it to you, but I guess it does. It says in verse 10, Who among you, or who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant? Now, let me just pause and make this observation here. His servant, I suppose, could mean like maybe somebody that's listening to the preached word of God, like maybe Isaiah, but also I sincerely believe it's a reference to our Lord Jesus Christ as well. So who is, who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant? Now notice this, that walketh in darkness and hath no light. Well, under those circumstances, let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. Now, this is truly an unusual verse that is uh, addressed to a group of people who are in really a predicament. And, of course, we will not elaborate on that. But uh, they are very much afraid because they're walking in darkness, and it seems without a trace of light. Now, under most circumstances, we realize that that would be a very foolish thing to do. But this text, here in this text, the Lord is encouraging his people, if, if they are going to be successful, if they're going to have some form of comfort, if they're going to get where they are, are headed or where they're going, they're going to have to rely upon him. They're going to have to depend upon him. And that's what he's saying there, I suppose, in summary. Now, was this something easy to do? They're walking in darkness. That's what it says there. And God says, just keep it up. Depend on me. Continue to do it. So is that something easy to do? Probably not. Because it really seems contrary to good common sense. But common sense is not the only thing we should appropriate in times of uncertainty. When the times are uncertain and we cannot uh, find the kind of direction or we cannot understand everything there is to understand, the text implies that faith, trust, confidence in God is what we're going to need. It is superior, by the way, to common sense. We're prone to use our common sense in times that we cannot see and do what we uh, think we should be doing. But God says to follow him in this darkness and instead of just using common sense, faith. Now, if you can see something other than that after the service this morning, perhaps you should let me in on it. I realize that that's difficult to incorporate into our thinking because we're accustomed to doing uh, something that we can see. And, and if somebody asked you to walk in darkness, you know, you'd be apprehensive. I would be apprehensive if somebody just uh, shoved me out. Per, perhaps this would serve as an example. I, I remember in my earlier years as a, like just say as a teenager or a child, you might be somewhere and uh, a group of older kids, it's dark outside and, and they want to shove you outside or they want to take you somewhere like on a snipe hunt and, and you got to run around in the darkness. So there's some apprehension there when we are in the darkness. And uh, 
so material darkness then, and, and I'm going to specify two types of darkness here. Material darkness can be a great hindrance to us. If a man cannot see, he finds himself sometimes in some very precarious circumstances. And I'm, I'm talking about the fact that there is such a thing as uh, us going out into the material darkness and finding ourselves in some life-threatening circumstance. So that, that helps me to understand that God really did not create me to just walk around in darkness. That is not his ultimate plan for me, is for me to just go out into the darkness. So if anybody survives, they got to have light. And the source of all light is God. And if, and if we did not have the knowledge of material darkness like you will see in a few hours, and that's what I'm calling material darkness, if we did not have knowledge of material darkness, then we'd fail to understand what spiritual light and spiritual darkness are. We would not comprehend that if we did not have an example as far as the material darkness goes. So there's a spiritual darkness as much as there is a, a material darkness. But interestingly, both have mysterious qualities. Both the material darkness and the spiritual darkness have what I would call mysterious qualities. Now, there may be somebody sitting uh, behind a desk somewhere, maybe some academic somewhere that would leave you with the impression that they understand everything about material darkness and they don't have any fear of it. But that is unlikely. It's just as unlikely of that being true as it is if you told me today that you don't worry about uh, spiritual darkness in any sense of the word and that you don't have any fear of it. You do. Now, I apologize, but if you looked at the bulletin, uh, there is a word there that I, I use there. In fact, I think the title of the message is The Enigma of Darkness. Darkness is enigmatic. In other words, it, it is something that is Difficult to understand. It's something we don't understand. So I'm, I'm saying, that's why I say it has this mysterious quality to it. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at darkness's mysterious quality. Quali I guess you could just say quality. But that doesn't mean that we're going to cover the whole nine yards we're just trying to make a point. We're trying to make an observation. And I think it's a good observation, and you'll appreciate it when you hear it. But we're going to discuss these mysterious qualities by presenting to you that there is a negative aspect to darkness, and there is a positive. There is something that seems to go against us when we think about and when we're in the darkness, but there is also something good about being in the darkness or otherwise God would not have told the Israelites here to go through it. So understand it from that perspective. Now, with that, let me just establish that the fearful, there is a fearful quality of darkness. And I understand that even though the text does not directly say that God's people feared walking in darkness, I understand that I can read. But I think if you read and think about it, you have every good reason to suppose that they were afraid. If they had not been fearful, there would, have been a, there would have not been a reason to give them the kind of encouragement that the Lord gave them there because he said, you keep it up, you walk in this darkness, but you trust me, you depend on me. So we can conclude then that they had some apprehension and they had apprehension for several reasons. And, and I can't cover everything, but let me just give you a few. First of all, 
Darkness deprives you. It deprives you of something necessary to your well-being, and that is light. Darkness deprives you of light. Without light, you can't be certain of your direction. Now, I understand in modern times there is such a thing as, I don't even know what you call it, uh, radar, sonar. Sonar might be for the water. I don't, I don't know. I understand some of the technicalities, but we're looking at this from an ancient perspective and something that was true in not too distant past. So you have no direction. Without light, you can't be certain of your direction. Without light, you do not know if you'll encounter some obstacle. You don't know what's in the darkness. Without light, you could be wounded. You could be hurt. Light is necessary to our well-being. God did not create us with the ability to function very well in darkness. In fact, without light, we will die. Light is an energy source. And if we don't have it, we'll die of starvation. Plants have to have it, and we have to eat those plants. You understand that. So it's necessary to life. So if we... Um, apply that to our current circumstances, that we are experiencing a spiritual darkness that is as depriving to us as the material darkness would be. Now, we're, we're in this. We are in a spiritually dark condition, if you think about it. What Christian on earth at this present time knows exactly what's going on? Do you know of a Christian anywhere? Have you heard of some superstar preacher stand up and say, now I know exactly what's happening here and this is what's happening and I can put my finger on it and you can bet your bottom dollar on it or whatever, and this is what's going to happen next. So you know somebody like that? I don't think you do. I don't know anybody like that. The only thing I have is what you've got. And do you know what you've got? You've got a Bible, and we've got information. We have instruction from, the, from our God, from, from the Lord, that when we're in darkness that we're to trust Him, that we're to trust Him, that we're to have faith in Him. So there's a lot of people, some, somebody may think they've got it all together. In fact, I, I wanted to preach a different kind of message today, but I thought, you know, I don't have it together. I don't know what I need to know. There's a veil, there's a cloud that's covering uh, my wisdom, if I have anything. So um, another fearful quality of the darkness is that the darkness distresses us. It's distressing to think that in our weakened condition, we might encounter something that is so overwhelming, it will destroy us. And that's exactly what the disciples encountered when they were out on the sea in that small boat one night. And when they cried out, uh, when they were being tossed on the waves and there was nothing else they could do. They did not know what to do and they cried out to Jesus and said, Master, we perish. And when we do not have the ability to control life-threatening situations, it's not so easy to be peaceful. It's not easy to trust. It's not easy even to rely upon God when we can't control things that are around us. Instead, we often become desperate and attempt to do things that will not help us. That may be where some people are right now and where some are headed the stress is destructive and may be reaching and we may be reaching out to grasp anything that gives the appearance of support you know how you would clutch for something in the darkness you would clutch for it and it may be the wrong thing 
And I'm sure that there are some people, you know, if we could just sit down and talk with them, we would learn that they are stressed out, that they don't know what to do. They don't know what's coming next. And we could go on and on with that, I realize. But let me give you a third reason, this fearful quality of darkness, what it concerns. And I would suggest to you that this darkness is daunting. You see, if you're enclosed in material darkness, you will likely not know what to do. Now you pick out and come up with your own scenario, but I have something that I want to share with you. First of all, let me just say, if you are in a circumstance like that, the material darkness has gathered around you and it's thick and it's deep, that means you're directionless. That means nothing looks right. I mean, you can come up with all the visuals in your head that you want to, and you can try to make some sense of it, but it doesn't look right. And nothing looks best. What is the best? You're in darkness. You cannot see what is best. Nothing looks promising. Nothing works. I thought about a, a diver, and, and I'm, I'm not a deep-sea diver, uh, and I think I got this right. But if you dove into the sea, and I mean you went down, you know, really far, I understand, and see if the light, you know, was dimmed above your head and, and there was no light, you can lose a sense of direction. You could be swimming in the wrong direction. In your mind, you think, well, this is best. This is right. This is what I should do. Because I should go in this direction and do this and do that. And you could find yourself in a world of hurt. It's, it's a daunting circumstance. Under the circumstances, the darkness takes on a very dismal character. It's disappointing and hopeless and it can be like that darkness that paralyzed the Egyptians in the book of Exodus, the 10th chapter in verse 23, where it is said of the Egyptians in this time of plague that was upon them from the Lord, they saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. Darkness so thick and so heavy that you are paralyzed, that you cannot do anything. It's daunting, it's dismal, and it, it's an awful predicament to be in. And that may be true of some people in this uh, pandemic, as we call it. They may be overcome by disappointment and it's just too difficult to exist in these circumstances. So darkness is a mysterious circumstance that has not only a negative quality, but I told you earlier that it has a positive quality as well. Because the Lord told the Israelites, and this is what he said, he said, those of you who are walking in darkness without light, and by the way, Somebody may be just thinking about material darkness here, so let me let you in on a little secret, okay? And this is the way the Bible presents itself. But you could say, those of you who don't understand what's going on, you just keep doing what you're supposed to do and trust the Lord, okay? That's a simple way of understanding it. So there's a mysterious circumstance. No light for them. They were told just to trust in him. So let's examine what I would call the promising. You know what a promise is. It's something that is presented and we believe that it's dependable, that it can come to pass. And so, you know, promise. There's a promising quality of darkness. Now it's difficult for us to see because we're most acquainted with the negative aspect of darkness, 
which we most often associate with evil. Whenever we think about darkness in biblical terms, most often we think it's something that has no, nothing good could possibly come out of darkness. God's saying, walk. If that's, if that's what, you know, if you're in the darkness and you can't comprehend, keep walking. But trust, but trust. So what, is there something good here? I'm skipping over some notes for your benefit. What's interesting about all of this too, and see, this may be a little difficult to comprehend, and I'm not going to read it to you. I'm telling you where it's at. If you've got verse 10 in front of you, it's interesting if you read verse 11. Because if you read verse 11, what you're going to find out that God said to those that create and those that make their own light and those that say, this is my way. I, I, I know I've got it all together and this is what I'm going to do. Those that make their own fire and their own torch and go their own way. God said, how did he say it? This shall ye have of mine hand. You'll lay down in sorrow. In other words, it won't do you any good. It won't do you any good to go your own way and do your own thing and think you've got it together. Just not going to help you out under these circumstances. So how does darkness promise protection to us? Well, surely the people in the text that were obeying God, because that's established, those of you who've been obedient are obeying God. So those in the text who are obeying God could not comprehend why God even allowed them to enter into this predicament. Lack of understanding, we don't, we don't know. So we all assume that if they are obedient to God, and this is the way we think, if we're obedient to God, nothing can go wrong. You ever think that way? Uh, give you a little personal side of myself. I do that once in a while. I look at me and I think, you know, I'm a preacher. I pastor a good church. Man, they're paying me. I got a lot of good things going for me. Nothing, you know, nothing can, can go wrong. I mean, you know, because what, what would God possibly do to me? You know, I... Now, those are passing thoughts. They just come through my head and I push them out because they don't benefit me. And so I get rid of them. Uh, so all Christians should anticipate trials and tribulations. You know that from reading the scripture. Even though we don't understand, we may not understand. We're, we constantly question what happens to us. Now, in some instances... There is no need for us to say, why, Lord? Now, you probably do that. I do that. We get in some predicament, and we can't see our way. We, don't, we somehow or the other don't know what to do, and we say, why, Lord? Well, there's sometimes you don't need to say that. Look at the verse. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to go on. And you're supposed to trust God. That's what it's saying there. That's what we're challenged to do. We live by faith according to the New Testament, and there are plenty of uh, verses that we could use to back that up. I'm not giving them to you, so you, you, you're aware of them anyway. So what should we consider a possible reason why God permits us to go through such a thing? Why, why, is, it, why is it? I mean, if we, if we need some kind of answer... Well, maybe we should think in terms of protection. Could darkness provide any kind of protection? Well, let me think about this for a minute. It's a dark, extremely dark night, and probably I'm I'm in the wood or in near the woods or whatever, and the enemy knows has spotted me, but I decide that I'm going to run. And I run out there 
into the deep, dark woods, and they don't have any flashlights or they don't have any way to, to find me. Could darkness be protection under those circumstances? Oh, so you agree with me. So, so there is a good quality to this mystery here. Darkness could be protective. Now, I don't understand why God does what he does, but he tells us to keep on walking. And one of the, I, I think this is a good illustration, whether you think it is or not. When God led the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage, I'm talking about they were packed up, they had their goat carts filled to the brim, and they had their donkeys and camels, and, and everybody was ready to go, and they started going, and they were leaving Egypt. You know what the Bible says in the book of Exodus? Uh, I, I have the chapter somewhere, somewhere. It's in the book of Exodus, 13th chapter. You know what it says? It says that God did not, and this, these are my words, but God did not take them on the shortcut. They could have just gone north and they would have been in Canaan. But interestingly, God said, I'm not taking them that, that way. Exodus the 13th chapter. I'm not taking them that way and here's why. If they see war, if they see it, and, 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 and I, I think this is, this is inferred, but, but anyway, the words war is not inferred. He said if they see war, uh, anyway, it's not going to be good for them. Maybe I should just turn there and read it. Uh, but anyway, so he took them through the wilderness. And do you know what? They probably never understood that. They were probably people thinking, wasn't there a shorter way to get here? Duh. But see, God had some reason for doing that. And he was protecting his people at that particular time. It would not have been a good idea, just like it was there when, the, when Pharaoh and his army came up. It was not a good time. So God said, I can't do that. I'll take them another way and I can hem them in and I can do this and they can cross the river. Anyway, protection. I hope you can understand where I'm coming from. Let me quickly move along. We also notice that the darkness has the promise of preservation. That sounds like protection, doesn't it? The promise of preservation. Now, if we borrow the truth from nature if we're permitted to do that as Jesus did from time to time, perhaps we might understand why we do not have a clear understanding of what's going on today. If we think about a truth from nature. Now, in the past or in days gone by, if I wanted to preserve something from nature like my vegetables, did I say that correctly? Perhaps some grapes or some potatoes. Potatoes, pardon me. If I wanted to preserve them, I would take them out in the sunshine and just let them stay out there. Some of you would starve to death through the wintertime. No, what I do is I put them in a cold dark, when I say cold, I'm not talking about a cool, we'll say cool, in an environment where there's very little light to preserve them. You see, you can put them there in the dark corner of the cellar and they, they, they're, they're preserved much better than if you were to just lay them out here on the sidewalk and think whenever you wanted something, you would just come by and get it. No, the sun would obviously dry them up. Now, we may not know exactly what God is doing, but we know that even though we don't understand everything, he is preserving us. And we need to understand it that way. It's difficult. But he says, use faith, and we're being preserved. In fact, and, and I could not do this. It, it, it would just have taken more time than what I've got. But if you go through the book of Revelation, you know, Years ago, we heard this, and maybe some of you are still hearing this. I, I don't pay any attention to this 
uh, kind of stuff about the, the rapture and the church just getting out of here and, and everybody else is going to experience the, the tribulation. No, we're going to be here and we're going to be here in tribulation, but God is in the preserving business and throughout the book of Revelation, if people would just take the time to read it, they would see that in many of these trials and tribulations, God is preserving his people. It's a dark time to everybody. We don't know what to do except, what does it say there? To trust God, to rely upon him. So there's the promise of preservation. Finally, I don't know who was looking for that, but finally... I want you to notice how darkness has the promise of power. Again, from nature we learn of the power of darkness or the power that darkness has on something simple like a seed. How does darkness have power over seed? Well, take your seed and come lay it on the curb right here and I'll take my seed and I'll dig a hole and lay the seed in the darkness of the ground. And which do you think is going to manifest its power? <laughs> gotcha! The seed in the darkness. There is some kind of power. Did I say anything about mystery? That God has mysteriously created a circumstance that if a seed is placed in darkness, that it can come forth very powerfully. Now, I don't have time to do all of this. I wish I could really show you this. But when our minds have been covered with a, a veil of darkness, when we, shall we say, come through it, we, we have a, a new perspective. We have a more powerful expective pers perspective when God is taking care of us in the circumstances like I've just described to you. And it's phenomenal. Now, this is the finality of all of it. Jesus, uh, listen carefully because this is going to take you someplace. Jesus experienced the darkness of death. Now, if I got that right, nod your head like this right here. Jesus experienced the darkness of death. He experienced the darkness of a trial without any defense. Did I get that right? Yes, no. He experienced the darkness of the day that his father forsook him. Does anybody remember the cross? Did Jesus say that? Did he say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Wasn't that a dark moment in his life? He experienced the darkness of the grave. He experienced the darkness of Sheol. I don't think Sheol, when, when people, when, when everybody went there at one time, I don't think they had party lights down there, and I don't think they had street lights or anything like that. I don't know what, they, what was there. I'm sure they could see something, but I don't think it was like being out in the sunshine. But notice the words of the man, and I say Jesus, and these verses that I'm about to read to you, which are right there in front of you, except they come ahead of verse 10. I'm beginning in verse 4. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. That's powerful in itself. He waketh Morning by morning, he waketh mine ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God hath opened mine ear. I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. 
And I'm telling you, if you think about the life of Christ, Jesus went on. And it didn't matter what happened, what took place, what form of darkness or foreboding that came his way, he kept moving. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off my hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. You see what, what's happening here? All of this is going to be incorporated into the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is going to stand the test. And he is giving his testimony to us. He is near that justifieth me. So who will contend with me? Who's going to, who can stand up against this? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the God of the Lord God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lo, they shall all wax old as a garment. The moth shall eat them up. Those are some powerful words from someone who went through the darkness trusting God. Now, let me just show you something in closing. I'm just about through. Do you recall what our Lord Jesus Christ said when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane? It was a time of great darkness coming upon him. And he said, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, that is some indication to me that this was something that he thought, I don't really want to go through this if I can get out of it. But I'm for the will of God. And I know that my heavenly Father loves me and will take care of me through all of this. And that's all I'm telling you today. Go walk through this darkness. But, with this in mind, that God wants you to trust him. He wants you to trust him. Dear Heavenly Father, what a joy, what a privilege it is to have the word of God and to have it as the great source of light and instruction to us. And we thank you for our Savior who went on before us and who did as an example, what we're supposed to do. And I pray that if there's someone here amongst us today that is not strong and they need your strength, that you will be with them, help them to rely solely upon you and to follow even though they don't comprehend. This is not the time and the place to get off. This is not the time and the place to quit church or to quit giving testimony or to believe that somehow or the other everything's just going to collapse in on us and we're not going to be able to get out from under it. This is the time for us to believe you and trust you and follow you like we've been doing. We pray that you'll give every individual here the strength to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me um, talk with you just a few minutes uh, by way of announcements and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, I thought I had a clamp board. I don't have to have that, but I thought I had it up here. So I don't see it. What it, what it is is uh, 